We open that and kind of understanding what we're doing with the black magic cameras a little bit too so please be respectful and uh, give him a listen if you got a question during the chat feel free to raise a hand and then we're going to do everybody's going to grab a black magic open da vinci and we're going to kind of practice what he's showing them. thank you Tom. yep all right yeah so like mr white introduced me i'm conlin i came and talked to you guys last semester about visual effects um, <clears throat> that was obviously very focused towards visual effects, which, like I mentioned, it's useful for everybody to know how everyone else's job in the pipeline works. But today we're going to be talking about something that applies to more than just visual effects, which is why I wanted to share it with you guys. So we're going to be talking about digital imaging and color science basics. And so I hate to say it because I was in AM, but uh, you guys are going to be getting definitely a much better presentation than AM did today because I forgot this keyword basics during the AM conversation. So I'm going to try and distill everything so that it actually makes sense and uh, we'll have more time for demos and for you guys to actually go out and shoot so that we can, we can keep learning. What's up? I said Andrew Shea. Yep. All right. So um, digital imaging and color science. So we are all filmmakers, like we're interested in different aspects of it, but as you guys probably know at this point, even though the term is still film, uh, most films of these days or videos or just things you're making are going to be shot digitally. And so when we're creating our, our digital images with our, you know, our video, we're taking it on a digital camera, working on it on our digital software, delivering it to digital monitors or projectors. Um, the key word there was digital. And you know, computers are complicated. And a lot of this is going to be complicated and technical. But like I said, I'm going to distill it. So we're going we're gonna to talk about some of the fundamentals first, then we'll get into some more demos and we'll have you guys shoot. Um, like Mr. White said, what we're going to be focusing on today is we're going to be focusing on shooting on our camera and we're going to be learning, we're going to be applying what we're learning with our digital imaging and our color science and color management. We're going to apply that to our camera settings and then once we have all of our footage shot, we're going to bring it into DaVinci Resolve. We'll do a quick introduction to that software. And then we'll also apply what we learned in that, in that aspect of color grading. So like I mentioned, um, this kind of stuff is more, more applicable to more than just like a single role compared to last time. Some of the roles where digital imaging and color science and color management are the most prevalent is going to be for cinematographers, if anyone's interested in cinematography. Um, digital imaging technicians are the people who ingest all of the footage that's shot and then give it out to the different departments. Um, it's very prevalent in that. Visual effects, I'm a visual effects artist, so there's a reason that I've learned and studied all this and that I'm presenting this today. And then another big one is a colorist, so color grading. That is a really large part of all of this. Um, and just anytime you're working with digital media with you know, filmmaking, so let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start with just like a review of science class, basically. So you guys remember the electromagnetic spectrum, and you guys remember that there's a section of it that's visible light. So I don't have to go too far into that. Based on that wavelength, we get these different colors that we can perceive as different colors when it enters our eyes. Inside of our eyes, we have cones and rods. So the rod is going to be how we see brightness. So if more light enters our eyes in one spot, and less light enters our, eye, uh, enters our eyes in another part of our field of view, that part is going to see darker. So right now I'm looking out towards the back of the room, and there's a light source right there that is beaming light. And to me, the light entering my eyes in that part of my field of view, I can clearly see that that is brighter because the rods are detecting all of that light. Meanwhile, also in my field of view, under the desk, it's in shadow, and there's not light bouncing there as much. So it, there isn't as much light from that part in my field of view entering my eyes, so it looks darker. So the rods are going to be handling the brightness and how we perceive it. So we've, we've covered brightness in our eyes, but the next thing is color. So we have three types of cones. So back to that wavelength of light here, we see that diagram at the bottom. And we see here we have, th we have some different, um, these different curves. So we have blue cones, red cones, and green cones. And so these are the three different types of cones we have. And they are basically these cones are most sensitive at their peaks to, this one is blue, so if it's at its peak, it's most sensitive around blue. Green, oop, there we go, green, most sensitive around the green wavelengths. Red, most sensitive around the red wavelengths, because that's where their peaks are. And keep in mind, they do actually, those curves do travel across the rest of 
the wavelengths of visible light, they just have their peaks there. But essentially, these are red, green, and blue cones are going to combine and mix colors so that when they enter our optical system, we are able to perceive these different colors in our visual field. So that's, how, that's what happens when light enters our eyes and how we perceive colors. But we have these things called cameras, you know, and they're kind of like they can take images kind of like our eyes and they can see the color and light around us. Um, so right here you can see this is a photo of a camera sensor, which you guys have probably all seen when you take the lens off. You can see that sensor in there. Um, inside of this sensor, it's split into a bunch of little blocks, a bunch of little buckets, which you can see here. Let's just look at this gray part for now, ignore this little color thing. And basically, light just enters these buckets and more light might, like, so just like I was talking about, if I'm looking here, more light from that light source is entering my eyes and that part of my field of view than under the table. Same thing with the camera. If I'm taking a shot of this, then more light is going to hit the buckets corresponding to that, you know, that light source versus under the table. So these buckets are going to be filling up with different amounts of light. And so that should remind you of the, the rods because I was, I'm talking about brightness and amount of light. But how do cameras see color? What they have is what's called the color filter array. So all of these buckets actually have this colored filter and you can see it's in the colors red, green, and blue. And that should remind you guys of the cones. Yes? Uh, on the last one, this one here? it was like, uh, this one? not that, like, um, like, not, it was like black, what's the, like, what's the just This right here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, perfect. I will cover that in about 30 seconds, so I'll come right back to that, don't worry about okay. it. Thank you for the question though. And yeah, feel free to ask questions. So um, you'll see there's a filter of color, uh, red, green, and blue, just like the cones, on all of these little buckets. So what this does is it filters out light of certain wavelengths, red, green, and blue, as it enters these little buckets. And so if you guys are familiar with pixels, like in a monitor or in a video file and stuff like that, um, they're like little grids of squares that contain color information. So this should remind you guys of pixels. One thing, though, is that there's, these are only one color. So there's a one red, one green, one gr and then another green, and then a blue. So really quick, we'll cover why there's two greens versus one red and one blue, which goes to your question. If we look here, this black line represents the sensitivity of our rods, so the sensitivity of uh, brightness for us. And you'll see this black one, which is our brightness sensitivity, is closest to green. And that means we are most, our green sensitivity is most lined up with our sensitivity of brightness, which means our eyes are most sensitive to green. And because of that, in each quadrant of four of these buckets, there's twice as many green as there is red or blue. So that's why we have um, two green, one red, one blue. So just like when we see our, when light enters our eyes and we have these red, green, and blue cones, and like, let's say I'm looking at this purple wall Purple isn't red, green, or blue. It's a mixture of you know red and blue. And depending on it, what it is, its hue could be shifted a little bit if we add some green or something. So these, these things mix together. But right now, each of these pixels, each of these little buckets, only has red only, green only, or blue only. So I'm, I'm not going to overcomplicate this, but um, essentially, if you look at this bottom right picture, this is what a camera sees initially. It only has red, green, and blue data. When it, takes, when it sees a picture, and then an algorithm inside looks at the nearby red, green, and blue, and it will sample and make every single pixel have red, green, and blue based on the surrounding pixels. So that can turn this into an actual full color image. So we're going to talk about some color now. So we have, after that point, we've taken like video or we've taken a photograph and we have these pixels with amounts of red, green, and blue stored in the file. How does that correlate to color? So three components of color, this is pretty basic, you guys are probably already familiar with this, you know, hue. So hue would be like, is it red, is it green, is it blue, is it purple, is it yellow? And then saturation is gonna be, you know, how vibrant that color is. So on the left, this is a more vibrant blue. As it gets less saturated, it becomes more gray. And then brightness, we've been speaking about that, you know, dark and then add brightness. Um, so one thing about this is we're representing these colors that have hue, saturation, and brightness with red, green, and blue components. 
So if we look on the right here, we see these red, green, and blue spheres. And we can see how mixing them together can give us these properties. So let's say we want the hue magenta. You mix red and blue, and then we can get a different hue than just red, green, or blue. Or you know, red and green is yellow. And you can see when you mix all three, it, it neutralizes each other. Because when there's an equal amount of these colors, they get neutralized towards white if, they're all, if there's a lot of all of them. Or if there's a little bit, of, if there's none of all of them, but all of them have, you know, there's zero in red, green, and blue, it would be black. So when there's equal amounts, no one color is able to, you know, overcome the others and become more vibrant, which basically means the saturation is lower. So by, with these red, green, and blue pixels, we are able to represent these different colors that have different hues, saturation, and brightness. Actually, yeah, let me bring up, OK, we, that is a very good question. Um, so one color, our color model is, I'm going to cover this quickly, I think. So red, green, and blue is how we're storing our pixel values. So we're representing colors by mixtures of red, green, and blue. Another way to represent colors is just by their actual hue, saturation, and brightness. And this is exactly what you were saying. So we're rotating around this cone as we're changing the hue. As we're going towards the center, we're getting less saturated. And as we're moving down in space, we're getting darker. So excellent, excellent. All right. Yeah. All right, yeah. So all right, this is where I need to make sure I'm not overcomplicating, so bear with me. So on this left, we can see these different displays. So you know, all of our displays, you know, wh whether it's this screen, these TVs, even projectors, they have, well, projectors, not, oh, we'll skip projectors. Just If it's a display with pixels, it's going to have red, green, and blue components for each pixel so that they can emit the light that the, the data in our images is representing. So like we were talking about earlier, you know, we can mix red, green, and blue to represent different colors. So let's talk about this diagram on the right that we're going to see a lot more. This was created by a, um, a French um, organization in the 1900s. And what it does is it represents all of the colors that a human being is able to perceive. And so something misleading about this is if you look at this screen or any of these screens and you're looking at the colors inside, something you might notice is that there's probably, you know, especially that one behind Mr. White, that one's kind of dim. This green up here, you know, this is supposed to be the most green green that we're supposed to be able to perceive. I mean, that's clearly not like, if, you've, if you guys have ever been to a laser show or a concert, you've 100% seen a more bright and more saturated green than that. So what's important to note about this diagram is the colors inside are misleading, yet they're also a guide. So our monitors are not able to reproduce all of the colors that we are able to see, but this chart has the colors inside just so you know like, oh, this top part is referring to green. So then why is this chart even useful at all? If you guys remember back to math class, you know, x and y, you can plot coordinate points. So what this chart allows us to do is even if we can't visually see what these colors look like, we can have a specific coordinate point that refers to a specific color. So like if, can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, shake it. Isn't that hilarious? It gets bigger. Does it stay bigger or no? Okay, I'll just, so like right around here, that specific coordinate point, if we had that there, that represents one specific green and like that is a unique green. So these, this chart can have unique coordinate points for unique, you know, colors as we see. So let's see, we talked about how, you know, our, that monitor is very clearly not able to display every color that we're able to see. So what is it able to actually display? So here we have that chart again. Um, there's some extra numbers, but we're just going to ignore those for now. And let's just say, let's pick a random green. So remember, there's a b red, green, and blue in here. So that means they're able to they have a specific red, green, and blue light in each pixel. And just like I said, there's these specific coordinate points refer to a specific green. So let's just, let's just say, OK, this point of this triangle, this is our green pixel. And that's the one we picked. This one right here, that's our red pixel. And then this is our blue pixel. 
So if those are the specific coordinates of the specific colors that the lights in our monitor are able to display, what does that mean? So let's look at this green corner of the triangle here. So that's our green light. And let's look at our red light here. If you see, there's a line that connects them. So let's think about it. If we, let's say we start at green and we start to add red. If you look at my mouse, we're gonna start moving from green along this line towards red. So when we have this green and we have this red, we're able to mix them and create any color, any unique color on this diagram that is between this line. Same thing, let's go red and blue. Same thing, we can make any of these. So that's gonna give us some pinks and purples. And then, you know, between blue and green. We're able to reproduce with these two light mixtures anything in between them. But we don't have two lights, we have all three. So you actually see this triangle. If, let's say, just to reiterate, this green represents, you know, let's say our monitor, uh, this, pic this green light in this pixel, this is the specific, this point on the chart represents that green. This point on the chart represents the red of our pixel, and this is the specific blue that our pixel is. If we have all three of those, they create this triangle, and that means our monitor is able to display any color that is inside of this triangle. And as we mix, so let's, let's think. So let's say we start at green, where, so we have full green, and we have no red or blue. Oh, my fault. And we want to add some red. It will travel along this line. So we've already talked about the line. But now let's say let's add some blue. All of a sudden, we unlock all of these colors. You know, and as we, as we change the amounts, we can get anywhere inside of this triangle. And if we have all equal amounts of these colors, it's going to be neutralized. So it's going to be no saturation. It's going to be white. And this dot right here represents you know, the white point. So one thing you might be wondering is why, you know, for this chart, I mean, I, those, I picked those specific points. So I picked this specific green, this specific red, this specific blue. Another thing you might be wondering is why that triangle is so small when you see how large all of the colors we can see are, you know? We might be... Some Minecraft enchantment. <laughs> or, that's fire. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so... We have. Um, I think we have a question. Oh, go ahead. That was, is it because that is the amount of, of that color that the monitor or screen can actually produce? That color? Yeah. Is that so, smaller than the big round? Yes. So if, if these all points represent the, um, the lights, the specific colors of these lights, this triangle represents all of the colors we can reproduce. But the question you might wonder is, OK, why don't we just make the green more green, the blue more blue, and the red more red, so that we can just get more colors from our monitor? Yeah, so that, you, you might think that might be our goal. And the other question is why I would randomly pick you know, this specific triangle. So we're going to talk about that now. So let's say you are, you're, so we're all digital image makers. So you know, we, we shoot video. We, when we're in our camera, we are on our set, we light our scene, we have our production design, we have our actors. We're looking through our monitor on our camera and we're like, yes, that looks how I want it to. You know, we bring it into editing, we edit it how we want. Then we take it to color grading. We grade it, we fine tune it, we, we push it even further and we're like, I am happy with how my image looks. That is our creative intent and all of our creative decisions along the way have made our image look that way on our screen. Now. What would happen if you were working on a screen that had your lights, so if your lights represented this triangle, what would happen if all of a sudden, you know, someone viewed your image where their green was shifted towards blue? And, you know, maybe their, all, of their, all of their lights were more blue than your lights are. All of a sudden, you, so on the right side, we have, you know, this is our artistic intent. We have, you know, we have made this image. This is exactly how we want it. This is how we've been viewing it. And... That whole point of that is so that we want people to see it how we intended them to see it, which is how we were working on it. If all of a sudden their monitors have different lights in them and they're viewing it in a different way than us, you know, it could turn out to look like this. It could turn out where they're not viewing it exactly at all how we, want it to, how we intended it to be looked at. And that's a really big issue. So the reason, so the first part that I'm going to answer is why I picked this specific triangle is I picked this triangle because it is a certain display standard. So this, is, this triangle represents a display standard of, uh, it's shared by sRGB. Has anyone heard of that? 
SRGB. Anybody have monitors that can do that? Yeah. Okay. All night. I don't know what that. Has anyone heard of Rec 709? Okay, yeah, so a few. So they share this specific triangle that is on the screen. Those lights, these corner points, those are the lights that the sRGB and Rec. 709 standards have. So the reason that we have these standards is that my greenest green, so let's say I had some really green, crazy image, and that's how I intended it to look, and my greenest green, while I'm looking at it, looks like that. If someone else, their greenest green was less green or it was more blue, it's going to look different because now all of a sudden they're viewing it in a skewed way. But if both of our monitors and our displays have been manufactured to a standard like Rec. 709 or sRGB, we're viewing it at that standard. So at least in an ideal world, our, you know, our greenest greens are the same, our bluest blues are the same, our reddest reds are the same, and our images are going to look pretty much the same. There's a, lot of, there's, a, there's a lot of nuance in this. Like, I don't know if you guys, normally they have them at like the home high schools, like the computer labs with all the Dell monitors and stuff where you can go and change all the contrast and color temperature and people always mess that up. And even on your phone, like displays often have a bunch of user settings that can get messed up. So at the end of the day, no one's necessarily going to be seeing it exactly as you intended it to be. But if we're working with standards, we can at least get as close as possible which is the best we can do. That's the best we can hope for. So that's what we want to do. So that's why I have this specific triangle is because it represents one of the display standards. And actually this sRGB triangle, that is the standard for web. So whenever you have an image that you're uploading to the internet, that's going to be the standard for you know, what the reddest red, greenest green, and bluest blue is. So the second part of the question is, OK, if that's the standard, and if it's on the web, and like, all these monitors are manufactured to the standard, why is the triangle so small? Why don't they just get more green, green, you know, or more blue, blue? So first part of that is manufacturing. So I'm not going to overcomplicate this as much as I did last time. But for these really pure, um, saturated colors that would be more towards like up here, a green up here, that's going to be approaching more laser-like light sources. So if you look around, do you guys see the shape? Do you see these numbers around here? It goes from about 400 to about 700. I'm going to go back to this slide here where we have the wavelengths of light. And guess what? 400 to 700. So if we look here, as it goes from you know, violet to red, and then we go back here, about you violet, and then it wraps around to red, that represents the, um, that's similar to the triangle where we're mixing different amounts of these lights. But in this case, it's mixing these wavelengths of light. So if we had a pure green with no other wavelengths of light mixed in, it would be at this point. You know, it would be along this edge. But if we look here, our green down here is not a pure green at all. So <clears throat> why is the shape of the whole thing like rotated like that instead of like flat? Does that make sense? To be honest, I do not have the answer to that question. Okay. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Yep. This is the shape they chose. They, they have actually done a different version where the shape is slightly different. Um, but this is just the way they plotted their coordinate points, I guess. And it okay. happened to be in that shape, I guess. Cool. So sorry, that's not a very good answer, but okay. that is my answer. Um, so yeah, so if we had, if we wanted the most green and green possible, it would be along this edge here and it would be a pure wavelength of light. But a pure wavelength of light is not something that is very common. Even the sun, this is all of the radiation from the sun and this is the visible light. You see how it is not like a single line at like a certain color. It's a wave that travels across all of the different colors. And then even here, I've mentioned that light can come from sources. And then light also from those sources will hit surfaces. Some of it will be absorbed and then some will be reflected and bounced back into our eyes. And so even something like a rose, which is red, this represents what gets reflected from a rose, which is the color that it appears. It's not a single spike at red. It's a whole wave that travels across, which that goes to show that you know, a very pure signal along this edge is not very common. And the things that get close to that would be like a laser. And so for, in terms of manufacturing, um, 
first of all, that's really expensive. So the more laser-like they want these, prime, these lights to be, the more expensive it would be and unreasonable. And also, I'm not even, I'm not a manufacturer. I'm not even sure if it would be like physically possible to make a monitor like that. Like there is an IMAX laser display, which is a projector that shoots out lasers and then they bounce off of a white screen into our eyes. But if in a screen, these pixels are emitting light at us and I don't think it'd be possible to just shoot lasers at us. I don't know. That doesn't sound good for your eyes, personally. Per personally, I'm not down for that. All right, so that's one reason that this triangle is kind of small. So now we're gonna talk about something a little bit complicated, um, but it, is, it ties in to all of this and is another reason the triangle is small. So have any of you guys heard of, even seen, have you ever seen like the word like 8-bit, 10-bit? Okay, cool. Cool, so yeah, that refers to something called bit depth. So what that does is, you know, a bit is how we can represent numbers and with more bits, we can represent a wider range. So if we look at this chart here, if we have one bit um, in terms of color, or I guess it's a grayscale here, one bit we can represent black or white. So that's only two options. Two bits, all of a sudden, we have four. Three bits, all of a sudden, we have eight. And by the way, in case you guys are curious, the conversion is two to the number of bits power. So as we increase in bits, you guys see how we have more precision, and that means we have a larger range of numbers between black and white. So um, that means we can prevent issues like banding. So if we see here, this gradient from black to white, I mean, right here, it's literally only black and white, and then it's choppy, 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 and it gets smoother and smoother and smoother. And we can see banding up here with color as well. So right here, it's choppy, you know, these really harsh transitions because there's not enough of a in-between, between, between the minimum and the maximum versus this really smooth gradient here. So um, you might be thinking, okay, why don't we just have you know, infinite bits so that we can just have so, so much precision, so many numbers, and a perfect gradient. The issue is each of these is what would represent you know, a number on your disk. So if we shot a one-bit video where we could only have black or white, every pixel would either have a zero or a one for you, black or white. And as we increase that, you know, in 8-bit, we have 256. So each pixel for red, green, and blue, we can have, you know, 256 different possible numbers. So in this case, we start at the number zero. So it's from zero to 255. If we had, you know, that means that with all of those, that precision, it comes a cost of writing more numbers and what that means is when we have numbers and we have more of them and more precision saved to our hard drives, our file sizes gets bigger. And so the issue with that is with storage. So you guys know with our SD cards, with our internal drives, we have a limited amount of storage. And when we're moving files or downloading files or uploading files to the internet, it takes time based on how large those files are. So the more precision and the higher the bit depth, the larger these files are going to get. So they're going to be more precise, but they're going to be larger. And so you can't always afford, you know, infinite precision. So back, um, you know, decades ago when we had floppy disks, um, the standard was 8-bit because, you know, 8-bit, we have 256 different amounts of red. So red can be from 0 to 255. Green can be from 0 to 255. Blue can be from 0 to 255. So in that case, it means if red was zero, that means that red light in the monitor is going to be off. If green was 128, which is about halfway in between, that green light would be halfway on. And if blue was 255, that blue light would be completely on. And based on these numbers, it will turn these lights on in different amounts, these red, green, and blue lights. And that will just, like we've talked about, let us mix these colors and we'll have different you know, hue, saturation, and lightness based on these mixtures. So 8-bit, um, it gives us, with, with only 256, 256, 256, that's a relatively smaller file size compared to, if we go up to 12-bit, 4,000 different numbers, that's going to be a way larger file size. Even with just 256, we get 16 million possible colors.
Uh, are you saying the file size is proportional to the actual number of possible colors rather than the number of bits? Um, the number of bits is directly correlated to the amount of possible colors, and the file size is connected to the amount of bits. And I have a graph right here that shows, so 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit, 14-bit, 16-bit. This shows that as each time the bit depth increases by a unit of two, it's about 25% of an increase, assuming that we have this amount of pixels is the same, if that makes sense. Because we're writing more data, so we have to have more numbers to represent that data, which means it's going to be a heavier file size. So um, back in the day, like I mentioned, this diagram was made in the 1900s, and then sRGB and um, Rec 709, those standards I talked about, those were created before the year 2000. So they were still on this you know, older technology, and so they, they were locked to 8-bit. So we've talked about that kind of banding that happens when you don't have enough of a range between the two, between your start and your endpoint. Now let's apply that to our triangle down here. So the reason that they chose these specific points is based on the distance between the colors. So what they found is that with 256 different shades between you know, the red and the green, what we can get is if we have, you know, let's say our green amount is 100, and then we have a pixel next to it with a green amount of 101, those two, they look different, but it looks still like a smooth transition. Meanwhile, if we made this green and we put it far in the corner, that stretches out the gradient between that green and that red. And what we didn't do is we didn't increase the amount of steps that we get in between. So now if we have you know, a green amount 100, green amount 101, all of a sudden, those colors are way different and we get a choppy gradient like this. Does that make sense? So that is the reason that this you know, smaller standard was chosen. And so this is, we have more modern storage technology, but most monitors are still manufactured to the sRGB and Rec. 709 standards. Um, so 8-bit is still going to be the standard if you're delivering to web, um, despite faster technology, which means we're going to be using 8-bit a lot of the time. OK. So we've been talking about all these triangles. And remember, the triangles, the tips of the triangles is the, the specific color of the light that we're talking about. And then the inside of the triangle is all of the mixtures of colors that are possible with those lights. So on the left, we've been talking about this one already, sRGB Rec. 709 triangle. They share that same triangle. But over here, we see some larger triangles. And we were just talking about how, oh, you know, this one was picked because of all these limitations. But I also mentioned how sRGB and Rec. 709 are pretty old. So in the middle, we see P3. And actually, all of the monitors like, around you guys are P3 monitors because Apple like, implemented that a little bit ago. So the greenest the green in an Apple monitor is going to be much more green than the green in like, an average sRGB monitor that you would buy. So it's able to produce more colors on the Apple screens, which is one reason that they're like kind of sought after. The P3, um, this specific triangle, is also going to be the standard for a movie theater projector. Um, so that allows you to, um, if you're working on a monitor that has a P3 capability, because remember how I was talking about uh, that creative intent, you want to have like those same lights as the other, as the person who's viewing it. You could work on this wide monitor, this wide gamut. So this is like the regular gamut. Um, I didn't, OK, I'll define the term gamut really quickly, my fault. So this triangle, um, do you guys know the term gamut just in the English language? Like it kind of means like encompassing things. The term they chose for this triangle is a color gamut because it shows the encompass, it encompasses all of the colors inside of this triangle. So. These larger triangles are going to be called wide gamut because they are able to produce more color. So if you were delivering for a movie which has a wide gamut projector, you would want to be working on a wide gamut monitor so that you can predict what the movie theater audience will see so that your creative intent can be maintained. However, you might be worrying that, OK, I, you just said that sRGB is the web standard but my monitor has different greenest green, bluest blue, reddest red. 
Fortunately, because this triangle is larger than the sRGB triangle, you can actually still, the software in your computer can know that um, the greenest green in sRGB, sorry, let me restart. So the greenest green in sRGB is not as green as the P3 one. So that means we could just turn down our amount of green in P3 and we could get the sRGB green. So that's what it does. When you're browsing the web on a wide gamut monitor, assuming you're in like a color managed browser and color managed just means that your software has an understanding of all of this kind of stuff, it will just turn down your green to where the green of sRGB is so that you are viewing images as everyone else is on the web. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, yes? Um, so down there on that one. Um, uh, which one was it? The, the, you know, color chart thingy with all the units. Uh, the top left? Uh, no, lower. This one? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that some of the, the triangles for the gamuts go outside of the like, actual color thing. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Yeah, yeah so good, good question. question. So um, we are going to cover, so we've talked about a wide gamut, and we can see P3 is wide. It's a larger triangle, but it's still inside of this shape here. But now let's talk about some, that's a, the wide gamut, that's a wide gamut for a display, but cameras also want to be cut, they want to capture as much color as they can. You know, that's kind of a selling point, but also when you capture more color in your camera, you have more color to work with when you're color correcting and stuff. So cameras will have wide gamut, um, they can capture wide gamuts of color as well. One issue though is that this outside shape is not a triangle, so there's only, like this Rec 2020 is pretty much the biggest triangle that you can fit inside of here, and you can see it leaves out a lot of colors. So what they do, uh, I guess you could probably make it a little bit bigger if you brought the point there, but still there's colors being left out. So what they do is, um, because these color spaces, or sorry, these gamuts are not corresponding to lights in our monitor, they're, these gamuts for cameras are recording and then they're just writing it. They don't have to worry about the, the greenest green. So in this case, the greenest green is not even visible, so it's not a real color. So if this was the gamut of a monitor, it just, that wouldn't be able to be displayed. But these camera um, manufacturers, they can make these triangles bigger and go outside of the bounds. And then just when they're recording the color, they can just make it stop when it gets outside of that range. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, so you'll never see a display gamut that goes outside of the bounds because a light in the monitor wouldn't be able to produce that color. But by making the, bound, by, by making the edges of the triangle go out of the bounds, you can get more of, you can get a larger triangle for more colors. Um, so yeah, so on th this one shows S gamut and S gamut three, um, which is a Sony. So that's, the S is for Sony. So that's an example of a wide gamut that a camera manufacturer has so that it can capture a lot of colors. Down here, this is an Aerie, I don't know, some, some Aerie, maybe an Aerie Alexa or something. And you'll see this red triangle is Aerie wide gamut. So you'll see both of these are much larger than our display gamuts because the cameras want to be capturing as much color data as possible. So one question you may have is if we are only able to display, at least if we're for sRGB, this small triangle, what's the point of capturing colors outside of that? It's essentially when you're working with colors and color correction and color grading, you have more, um, you have a more mobility and you're able to push those colors around more because you collected more until you are done and happy with your image and you package it into like this display sRGB image. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So this page I'm going to glance over kind of, but the most important thing is that once again, we're talk we talked about color and this whole time we've been talking about color and brightness. So now we're gonna talk about the brightness part of this. So without overcomplicating, we're going to look at this picture in the bottom. And this picture is just supposed to be a representation of the way that humans' eyes kind of work, which is we are much more sensitive to darkness than brightness. So an example for this is if you are in a dark room, 
and then someone turned on their phone screen and it was on like the lowest brightness, which if I had my phone screen on the lowest brightness and I held it in this light room, there's barely any light coming from that. But if I'm in, if I'm in that dark room and then I have that little bit of light, it's pretty bright because we are very sensitive in that darkness. Meanwhile, if I looked up to the sun, which I would not recommend doing, and next to it I held like, you know, maybe one of those spotlights in there or something, that sun, the energy coming from that, it's like a ridiculous, it's like 40,000 or some insane amount more bright than this little light that's plugged into an outlet, you know? But we don't perceive the sun as being 40,000 times more bright as this because that would blind us because, you know, that's already so bright. If we perceived it as being 40,000 times brighter, our eyes would just burn, you know? So all that goes to show that we are more sensitive to dark than light. And so let's go back to the idea of down here we have, you know, bit depth and we have to worry about storage. So like with an 8-bit and even with higher bit depth, we have to, we want to maximize our utilization of the storage because we don't have that much. Like we only have 256 for red, green, and blue. We want to maximize that. So since we're more sensitive to darkness, what we do actually is when we save our, when our camera saves our images, um, you can kind of ignore this graph, but it is just a representation of what's happening mathematically. It's saving more data in the darkness than the lightness because we are able to perceive that difference more. So it's more efficient and it's also just better for us to save more data in the darkness where it actually matters because it would be more of a waste if we allocated more data in the brightness. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. All right, so what we just talked about um, that way that it changes the, and it kind of skews towards darkness, that is a term that, ref that refers to something called, has anyone heard the term gamma before? Okay, a few people. So gamma is a type of something called a transfer function, which I'm not going to really get into, but all that refers to is how it changes from the actual brightness to, you know, biasing towards the shadow. So it's just how we save the brightness of, ob of you know, objects in our camera. So we're, we're saving more data in the darkness. And there's different gammas, you know, there's different shapes of these curves that saves the darkness and brightness a little bit differently. So when we have that triangle, that gamut, and then we have uh, the way that it stores brightness, which is the gamma, well, I'll use that term even though transfer function is more, um, proper gamma is more widely used. With those two things, um, those are the main components of what something that is called the color space. So has anyone heard of that before? Okay, cool. So you've just learned essentially what a color space is, um, which is, you know, it's the, the greenest green, reddest red, bluest blue, and then the way that it saves brightness, you know, relative to how actually bright something is. So different um, things look at color spaces in different ways. So our monitors, they have their color spaces. So the, the most obvious part of a color space for a monitor is going to be you know, the color of the lights inside. The other part is um, of a, a monitor. If you see down here, it says display. If we look at this, this says camera, and it shows that curve up, which is how I was talking about, how it biases towards the darkness. When the monitor needs to display light, that light is no longer biased towards you know, darkness or brightness. Our eyes do that. So we need the light to just be actually representative of how bright something is. So the monitor does the opposite. It does the, a downward curve. So a monitor just has to have its, the colors of its lights and then whatever downward curve, and that defines the color space of a monitor. A camera, um, it has, Cameras can often shoot in multiple color spaces, by the way, but that's what we were talking about over here, where they can have you know, wider gamuts, and that's how they record when they're taking, you know, they're writing these files. They can take in all of these colors, and then they will record you know, red, green, and blue amounts, where if the green amount is at its maximum, it's referring to the specific point of whatever color space triangle it is, and then the way that it encodes to you know, bias towards the shadows is also um, part of the camera. And then our software also think about color space. So different operations in your software um, and different software even 
They run their math on different color spaces. Um, I'm going to very briefly gloss over this, but basically depending on your color space, the numbers that, um, a, like, if I took a photo of like that lamp with this camera and I changed the color space settings, I could make the image look the same with all three color spaces, but the number written on disk in that 0 to 255, or if we were in 10-bit, 0 to 10, 000, or 1,023, those numbers would be different. And that means when we're doing, when we're doing like color grading and you know, image processing, anytime you're messing with an image, it's just doing math on pixels. And because those color spaces have different starting numbers, the color space that you're working in and the operation is being applied in will affect how it works. But that's all we're going to talk about in terms of that for now. So we are, we've talked about sRGB and Rec. 709. I'm going to quickly, we've talked about how they have that same gamut, that same triangle. And so they have the same gamut, but they're separate color spaces. And the reason for that is because they have different gammas, which means that um, the way they think about brightness is different. So Rec. 709 is the standard for television. And its gamma just makes it so the image is a little bit brighter. And the reason for that is when you're going to be watching television, um, at least the goal for the, the companies for this is that you're watching it in a dark room, like in your living room. So it's brighter because the room is darker. For sRGB, it's meant to be looked at on an office, like while you're on the web, where there's a light surrounding. And so sRGB is a little bit darker because the surrounding is brighter. Does that make sense? OK. Cool. So they have the same gamut, but they are different color spaces because of the way that they handle brightness. So we've talked about those color spaces. Let's talk about another type of color space, which is log. And if anybody in here has a desire to see how what we do today goes to what we shoot and edit today, wake up, shake it off, and pay attention to this next sexy bit. Yep. This next right here is where we're going to be shooting. So we're almost there, guys. All right, has anyone heard of log or shot with log before? Yeah, has it, so you've shot with log before. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, so I should have said that. So because, like I've mentioned, there's different terms. So gamma transfer function, a lot of this stuff, there's different terms for it. So the log, when a camera, when a black magic camera shoots log, they call it film. So hands for f shooting film. All right, cool. Yeah, so nice. So you guys are familiar. So um, you guys are also probably familiar then with this washed out look up here, right? OK, cool. Yeah. So you might, you know, you might sh switch to your camera, switch to log, and you might just be confused. like. Why would I want this? This looks terrible. The reason that we want a log color space is because of its gamma or its transfer function. So I'm not going to overcomplicate this as much as I can. But if we look at this chart here, we can see how this is the sRGB. And like it pushes up, it pushes up, which means it's biasing towards more detail in the shadows. right? This log curve does that too. This red one, this is the Arri Alexa log curve, log C4. So it has more detail in the shadows, but then it doesn't go to this ending point. It actually goes past the bounds, and it just keeps going. And you'll see it's at an upward slope, so it's going to keep going past this point of 1. So what that means is um, log has a higher dynamic range. Is anyone familiar with that term? OK, cool. So for those who aren't, Dynamic range is essentially the, the, the range or like the distance between the darkest thing and the brightest thing. And I just said the word thing because it can apply in multiple ways. So our eyes have a dynamic range. And up here it says 24 stops. So if I'm looking at, um, once again, I'm looking at this lamp. That lamp is relatively bright and under that table is relatively dark. I can still see full detail in the shadow. And I can, and, and that light isn't like blown out. But you guys have probably, when shooting on a camera, have you you've seen stuff can get blown out and it gets like clipped to white, or maybe all your shadows get clipped to black and get really crunchy. Cameras just don't have the dynamic range that humans' eyes have, you know. 
So if something is super bright and you expose for that, you're going to lose the detail in the shadows and vice versa. So um, what log can do, though, is it can actually squeeze a bit more dynamic range out of our cameras because, you know, if we're, the way we're storing it is going to be, you know, shooting past those bounds, which you don't necessarily need to understand why that is. You just need to understand that we are, we're getting more dynamic range out of it. But um, one thing we do want to know is because we don't get this for free, you know. We have more dynamic range, but, okay, if that was the case, why didn't we just have more dynamic range in our other one, too, in Rec. 709 or whatever? Um, to, in order to store that dynamic range, let's go back. So that means we have a larger gap between our dark and our bright, which means if we're in these stepping sizes of 8-bit, all of a sudden, those, it's going to have that banding, you know? It's, it's, we're stretching it too far for those steps, and we need more steps. So when you're shooting log, you're going to need 10 bits, you know, at least, and a lot of log is going to shoot in 12-bit. And so, okay, that's fine. But remember, more bits, more it's going to be a larger file size. So let's talk about shooting in different color spaces right before we're actually going to, I'm going to demo it, and we're going to have you guys shoot in different color spaces. Um, so Rec. 709, I've been talking about this the whole time, and it might have sounded new to you guys, but I had forgotten to mention this. You guys have shot on these cameras. Have you guys shot in video mode before? Video mode is Rec. 709. So just like film is a log cam is a log color space, video is just what they call Rec. 709. So let's think about it. So Rec. 709 is or video is 8-bit, so we can get a smaller file size. That means that's a good, that's a pro, smaller file size. We, can, we don't have to spend as much money on our disks. We don't have to wait as much time transferring. But we get a smaller dynamic range. And uh, because we've talked about the triangle of Rec. 709 and sRGB, it's a smaller gamut of colors. One pro, another pro of it, though, is that it will look normal without post-production work because we're shooting in a color space that our monitors are displaying in. So like I've mentioned, you know, Rec. 709 and sRGB, those are display standards. If we're shooting in that standard, it will just automatically look good on that display. Does that make sense? But that is one reason why log, um, that's one kind of disadvantage of log, where it looks washed out. But log, that is actually only a disadvantage before you understand it. And you can actually completely work around it, and it's completely fine, which we'll go into. Um, but now, we'll, so we'll cover log real quick. So log or film mode on the Blackmagic cameras. You need more precision, so larger file size. You get a higher dynamic range. And another thing you normally get is, if I go back to this page with the cameras, is normally they pair their log um, gammas with a wider color gamut. So normally when you're shooting log, at least most of the time, you're also going to be in a bigger gamut, which means you get more colors. Um, and I wrote greater file size twice, I guess. So I guess we'll pretend I did that to just reiterate. But um, the other thing we mentioned is it requires work in post. So the reason it looks like this is, and it looks weird is because of this curve. You know, this is not meant for viewing. It's meant to just encode our data in the most efficient way to get more dynamic range. It's not meant to look good. So it's all washed out. So when we import it into our editing software, we have to make it look good. And when we're shooting, an issue you might have, and we're going to go back to that idea of creative intent, you know, how I was talking about you want your images to look how you want. You make creative decisions. That's really important. If you're on set and you're lighting, and you're like, OK, cool, you're on set, you're standing, you're the director or the cinematographer, and you're like, wow, it looks so good. Let me look in the camera. All of a sudden, it looks gray and washed out. That's going to be really annoying. And first of all, and then it's going to be harder for you to like deliver on your creative intent because it's going to look different in camera than it is going to be once you have your final product. So what you can do, though, luckily, is you can, there's workarounds for both of those two cons I just mentioned, is we can actually, on our camera, we can have a display which will look, um, it'll make it look normal while we're shooting, even though it's still saving in log. And now we are going to, I'm going to quickly go over the settings in the camera, and then we're going to get you guys in groups, and you're going to shoot something with a large dynamic range. So I'll pull up my example really quick. 
which is Mr. White. We shot this in the morning. Oh, that's the log one, sorry. So you can see here, um, this image has a large dynamic range because there's this really bright, oh, my fault, thank you. There we go, okay. This image has a wide dynamic range because there's this very bright light in this corner and it's shining on Mr. White and it's reflecting here, but then there's a lot of dark shadows. So our goal is gonna be shooting something with dynamic range. We're gonna make the same shot with Rec 709 or video and log. So you're gonna get like a tripod, you're gonna find a shot, you can make it whatever you want, just make sure there's enough dynamic range, you can be creative with it or whatever. Um, but we just wanna make sure we're gonna shoot it first in video and then first in film, and second in film. Can you rephrase, you wanna see a shot with lots of dynamic range? Just make it an easier way to understand. It. Yeah, so just like that one of you, we wanna be able to see lots of dark shadows but also, you know, spots of great brightness. Okay. Is that only achieved in our studio? Um, it could be achieved with like a window, if there's a, like, look, a window facing outside. Um, it's probably most easy to do in the studio and also most easy to like direct it to be creative. But, and it doesn't, this is honestly pretty extreme in terms of how dark that is and how bright that is. So, Make sure that there's enough dynamic range, but don't limit yourself. You know, we want to be creative too, but make sure there is like a decent range of darkness and lightness. Decent range of darkness and lightness. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and switch to the menu of the camera and check what time it is. Okay, yeah, we're fine. Okay, so you guys can see that. Let me stand up. Okay. All right, so Oh, it's shooting you guys. Okay, so we are gonna open our menu and we're gonna go through our settings. So first of all, um, we're going to maybe, we're gonna maybe touch on Blackmagic RAW and ProRes later. But for now, what I want you guys to do is click on ProRes and click on 422 and leave it there and then shoot at 4K. Um, actually, honestly, you could do either one, 4K or 1080p, but we want it to be 16 by nine HD. So one of these two, but ProRes 422. So you can take a picture of the screen if you want to, or just remember. So now we're gonna go to the next page here. And at the top here, we see dynamic range. So what this is changing is it's changing the color space. But like we mentioned, the dip, one of the main pros of Log is it has a greater dynamic range. So what they actually did is they just labeled it as, you know, they just labeled it as dynamic range for the color space setting. So we see in the middle extended video, we're going to ignore that completely because we've talked about Rec 709, which is video, and we've talked about um, you know log, which is gonna be, film is gonna represent the Black Magic's version of their log. So we're gonna be shooting in both of these two. So we're gonna start with video, and then we're going to go to our monitor, and we wanna make sure display 3D LUT is off, and we're gonna talk about that later. But now if we go to shooting mode, I might've, okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, right now it's not white balanced correctly or anything, so. And if you want to see uh, the shot a little cleaner, and you'll still get the data of the camera, I don't know, because you might want to see what your fingers are touching. Oh, I see, okay. See, what's um, the difference? It's not plugged in right now. Well, then never mind. Okay. So I'm not going to do it now because you guys know how to do this, but when you're doing your shots, implement all, everything you've learned, you know, white balance, all that kind of stuff. One thing I will mention is when we're exposing it is um, we do not want to clip the highlights. Even when we're shooting with a large dynamic range, our highlights can still get clipped. So I am actually going to really quickly. So remember, on record mode, keep yours in ProRes. Just because, um, so do this. I'm gonna click this just because that setting goes away when I plug this in, so don't, you just ignore that. Okay, yeah, and the setting goes away. And now I can go here. Okay. Okay, cool. So if I point this, you guys see that light at the top of that screen? Point out the light. Yeah, point up right above you. Uh, wrong direction, there we go, good yeah. stuff, good stuff. There, do you see that line? So if we click 
Um, uh, let me have it. I guess I have to go back to menu. Oh, I rotated the camera. My fault. No, it's all, right. It's all right, we'll keep it that way. Whatever. So if we click on this top left, we can get some indicators. And what we want is zebra lines. Do you guys know what the zebra lines do? OK, so we got one. You see these zebra lines up here? Notice how that is exactly where there is something really bright and white. So what our zebra lines are showing is when something is clipping in white. So do you guys know what false color is? OK. Show up in the shot? No. OK. Zebra lines is um, kind of a simplified version of false color. But if you guys know what false color is, you see that red. You guys know how that's not good? It's clipping that. So when we're exposing for our shot, we don't want to be clipping the highlights. Because if we're clipping it, we're not getting any more dynamic range because it's just getting cut off at the maximum value. If we have a high dynamic range and we expose properly, then we will be able to see all this detail in here, and it won't. Oh, what did I just do? Um, and it won't just all be like a block of white, you know. If you click iris on the screen and start closing it, yeah, yeah, you can start to see how the false color changes. Oh, you can hear the iris actually moving. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Okay, I'm gonna turn false color off, and then we can also. I'll show that with the zebra as well. So you guys know how iris works. We're gonna open it up, let more light in. It's getting overexposed and then you know, close it, boom. OK. So now I'm going to quickly switch back to here. So you guys know shutter speed, aperture, ISO. Um, did it work? Yeah, OK. Really quickly, this comes from the um, Blackmagic website. And I actually I took a wrong, the wrong screenshot on the left, because this is supposed to be the 6K camera. But um, it'll, the number, that means the exact numbers are going to be off, but it's going to be very similar. You can see this line has these numbers above, these blocks above, and these blocks below. Um, what that means is there's something called the middle gray, which I'm not going to go too far into, but it's essentially when we have black and white, middle gray is what we perceive as the specific gray that's exactly in between them. So the lines where these two meet represent middle gray. And then the blocks above show our dynamic range greater than middle gray, so brighter stuff. The blocks below represent our dynamic range for things that are below middle gray. So, and then right here, each of these is the ISO. So you, this shows how the dynamic range changes based on ISO for the Blackmagic camera. So when our ISO is 100, we get a lot of dynamic range in our shadows because this block is so deep. Do you guys see that? But above middle gray, we don't get as much, um, you know, we don't get as much dynamic range in our highlights. As we increase, it can get more evened out. So you know, like at a thousand, it's more even. Um, and then uh, the, do you guys know what native ISO is? Does Mr. White talk about that? Okay, we won't talk about that. But um, basically, there's two different charts because the these cameras have two native ISOs, which you guys will learn about later. But this second chart shows just for the ISOs above 1,000 how it also changes. And you can see how, as we increase ISO, we get more dynamic range in the highlights. So I mean, and you guys also know the effects of ISO, where we're gaining up our signal. And that means that we can get more noise. Or we can get, you know, if, if we're increasing ISO, it can get really noisy, but also brighter. Um, so just, you can, I'll leave this chart up while you're shooting, so you can kind of select an ISO. You want to make it work with your exposure triangle. You don't want to have too much noise, but you also want to maximize your dynamic range. So it's basically just everything you've already been doing, and then just give this a little bit of consideration, but also not too much because, you know, oh, you might want a lot of dynamic range in the highlights, but at that point you're at 25,000 ISO, which I, ho I hope you guys know that would be very noisy and very bright. Um, so yeah, just balance with that. So we're going to go back to the menu. So like I said, you guys are going to white balance. You're going to set your exposure, all that, for your shot. So I'm not going to cover that. Take a break, guys, at 1.30, and we'll give you 15 minutes while we get all the cameras set up. Cool. OK. So the first thing you're going to do is I'm going to unplug this back. So you're going to be on ProRes 422, and you're going to go to video mode. You're going to go to monitor. You want to have display 3D LUT off. 
And then we want to go to the next page, and then the next page, and we want to go to the very last page. Or wait, oh, I'm in monitor, sorry. Go back to record and go to the last page. Uh, wait, oh, where is it? Okay, sorry, the third page. And we want this checkbox to be off, record LUT to clip. So the three things we want to do is we want to have this off, so you can take a picture of that if you like. And also, before you guys go and shoot, I'll come check your camera settings, so don't worry about it. You want to be on video. You want to be on ProRes 422, and I guess it's four things. And then you want to be on your monitor. You want to have display 3D LUT off. So you're going to go and shoot your video mode. You're going to be on a tripod because we want to shoot the exact same shot with log and video. So you're going to have to also remember the log settings, but you can come and get me if you need help. And the difference between that is we're going to go to monitor, we're going to go to the second page. We're going to go to film, which you guys have probably done before. And then now let's go to the men out of the menu. Oh, what did I just click? There we go. Now you see how it's washed out in gray. You guys were used to this. Like I said, though, we don't want to be shooting with this because that's not going to allow us to see how it's going to look. That messes up our creative intent, our creative decisions. So what we're going to do is if we click on this LUTs menu, you can see here it says Gen 5 Film to Extended Video. We're going to click down here, Gen 5 Film to Video. So what that's doing is on our record page, we're shooting in film. And ig ignore the Gen 5 part for now. That's just the version that this camera is using, I guess. But what we're doing is we're converting from film to video, which means we're going from log to an actual displayable color space. So if we have this LUT selected, let's go to the out of the menu. We selected it, but it's not on yet. So you'll see, once again, still washed out. That's where you want to go to monitor. And now we turn on display 3D LUT. And this is the same for the other one, record. We just never want to have record LUT to clip on for the most part, unless you have like a very specific reason, but pretty much always have that off. So now on our monitor, display 3D LUT is on. Let's see what it looks like. We're recording in log, but we're viewing it as video. So that's what we want to have. So I guess, yeah, we're going to take a break. We're going to set up cameras. You guys are going to go in Teams come check with me with your settings and then you know get a tripod we're going to shoot the same shot with you know decent dynamic range with both film and then video and remember ProRes 422 and yeah then we'll be good and we'll come back sexy hot now 145 we start class again so you got a 15 minute break teams of two and work with somebody you don't usually work with and we don't have to start till 145. Go bathroom, go do your crunches, maybe go talk to your friends in other classes. Other cameras. One real quick. I'm gonna stop recording here, Con then. Should I stop this? Hit stop, yeah. No. Should I hit the hello? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay, we're good. All right. So everyone um, have your downloads folder open. And then right click on the finder and make a new finder window and put it to the side so you have two. Okay. Everybody see that? Yeah, hold on. That one can be complicated. Look at the screens. You're trying to do two finder windows. If you go file new finder window, you can have multiple finder windows. Up at the top, or click finder maybe. Yeah, All right. look, Tina's got two windows. Dawson's got two windows. Come Give me a thumbs up when you're good. Boom, 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 boom. Aaron, I'm going to assume you've got two windows. Maren's got two windows. Sarah. Lena's going to teach you. Yes, yes, yes. There you go. Moving. Okay, listen up, Caleb. This one's for you, Sarah Gile. Okay. Go ahead. All right, everyone have that? So one is your downloads. The other one is just random. Click on the one that's random so it's focused. Everyone got that? <clears throat> on the top bar, click on the Go button, and then click on the one that says Home. And it should say your name. Everyone got that? Okay, yeah, student ID. All right, I'm going to wait a little bit longer, see if everyone's got it.
All right. All right, everybody there? Go and then home, and it should be your file directory for God's Christmas. Go and then home. Okay, so on that home window, still keep it focused. Click on go again at the top. Click on go again at the top. Do you see at the bottom of this menu, it says go to folder, click on that. Uh, if it says anything, delete it. Yours might not. All right, and it should have this search bar. Type the word library. So L-I-B-R-A-R-Y. And we'll wait for everyone to be good. And then once you've searched that, just click on that, and you should have more folders if you like double click it. And don't mess with anything in here yet. We'll just wait for everybody to be here. All right, everybody open up the folder that is called application support near the top. And then that should open a bunch of more folders. Okay, after that go to Black Magic Design. That's the people who make our cameras and DaVinci Resolve. So open that folder. And now there should be only one folder called DaVinci Resolve. Black Magic Design? Yep. All right. In application support. Okay, launch. Have them launch DaVinci Resolve and then close it. Bless you. Yeah, let me know if that actually works. If that doesn't work, could they be in the wrong application support? Sector? They could be in the wrong library. Yeah. Is yours working? Okay. You all good? Good stuff. Okay, just, just uh, let us come around and try to help. Well, DaVinci's opening. Did the folder show up after you open it? Yeah. Nice. All right, so close it up once it fully opens and creates it. I don't think it's going to work for everybody. Okay. Did it say continue? Uh, let me see. Yeah, continue. Uh, skip and start right now and close it after that. Actually, yeah, it has to fully open first. I think we need your help, Conlon, with her, and I'll try to help Zach. Okay. Library, and there's no black magic design. There's application right, support. Application support. Okay, and you opened it and closed it? Yeah. Hmm. Hold the Alt button, or the Option button, sorry. The, yeah. Users, your number, library, application support. Okay. Mm. Aha. Sorry, okay, could you launch it one more time? It's, I don't know if that's actually going to work. Yeah. It's not in alphabetical? No. What? What? Oh, because it created the folder recently. Uh, ah, there we go. All right, there we go. All right.
And yeah, we'll have a recording of this, so these steps you can just follow if you need to do it again somewhere. So once they open Blackmagic Design, they're in a, okay. there's a folder called DaVinci Resolve. Yeah, so if everyone's there, open DaVinci Resolve, the folder. And then there's one called Aces Transforms, open that up. There's one called IDT, and that should remind you of the name of the file we downloaded, so open IDT. And then literally just drag the DCTL folder file that we downloaded called IDT Rec 709 Camera Rec 709 Lin Aces AP0 and drop it into that folder. And then if it's in there and me and Mr. White have seen it in there, you guys can close it, but we're gonna go, I'm gonna go check, but we'll see. All right. All right, I think everyone is good now. Okay. All right, so that was annoying, but it will save us from something even more annoying and complex, so it was worth it. So go ahead and close your finder, or I don't know, you can keep it open, I guess. But what we want to do now is launch DaVinci Resolve. So go to, you can go to Launchpad and do it. Launch DaVinci, guys, if you haven't. Launch the software. All right, so anyone have like a menu that says continue? Or does everyone's screen look kind of like mine, but minus Mr. White in these trees? Yeah, yours looks good. Okay. Yeah, we want yours to only be untitled project unless you've used Resolve before. All right, everybody's in. Looks yep. good. Okay, go. so what you want to do is just go into hit new project in the bottom right, and you can name it. I'm just going to name mine uh, based on what I did the other ones. And once you name it and hit create, it should open up the main interface. Aaron, you're in. <coughs> All right, we got one launching, and then. I know. I know. Just hit new project down there, Aaron. Yeah, and then call it something. Don't type this stupid shit or dumb fuck project or something like that. <laughs> Disrespect. <laughs> I, w I would get up and leave. Yes. Never come back. We'll check project names later. All right, raise your hand if you have used DaVinci Resolve ever before. Raise your hand if you've used DaVinci Resolve ever. Okay. Well, I see one hand only. Yes. Okay. You want these on or off? Let's go like, yeah, like that. It was a bit dark. All right, so everyone is good. Okay, cool. So DaVinci Resolve and Premiere Pro, you know, they're both editing software. And honestly, they're both really similar, I'll be honest. So I mean, you're gonna be importing your media, you know, your audio, your video. You're gonna be dragging it into a timeline. You're gonna be cutting it how you want. It's gonna be really similar. Even though the interface and the buttons are slightly different, there's no need to be scared. Um, one reason why DaVinci Resolve is stronger is going to be its page down here. So just like I think in Premiere, there's different pages for like editing or importing and stuff or different layout modes. Down at the bottom here, we have different pages. So this first one is for importing. Then we can cut our clips before we bring them into the timeline. This middle one is for it's, it's the Fusion page. It's kind of for VFX stuff, so we'll skip it completely. This one is this, the page that really sets Resolve apart, which is its color grading tools. So who has used Lumetri Color in Premiere before? Lumetri Color in Premiere, every hand should kind of go up. All right, cool. This Resolve is just Lumetri on steroids and better and smarter. So we're going to be diving into that. Um, so the color page on Resolve is one of the main reasons that I use it instead of Premiere now because, you know, honestly, cutting for me between the two is the same thing, you know, just cutting clips, importing. Different buttons, but it feels the same. But just the color grading on Resolve is just so much more strong. And a term we haven't necessarily discussed fully is color management. But Resolve is color managed, and Adobe Premiere Pro is not, which is pretty crazy, to be honest. But 
Um, Resolve is, it's, it's a lot, but it's also kind of just like Premiere, but different. So we're going to start by doing what we would always do, import your media. So go to that left page, that media page. There's multiple places you can do this, but it's meant to be done in this left media page on the bottom. And then there's a keyboard shortcut or you can right click, but let's just go to the top and hit file. And then there's the import menu and then hit media. And then just find your videos. For me, those are Mr. White. And then just hit open. And just hit OK if it asks to, for permission to your desktop and your document. All right, and then let me know when you guys have it imported. And bring in the two shots. Okay. You got your shots? All right. All right, all right. Aaron, you good? Yeah. All right. We're going to go now. So you can click in your media pool, and you should be able to see the clear difference between your shots. Everyone see one looks like video and one looks like log? All right, good stuff. All right, we want to bring these to the timeline. So we're going to just skip over this cut page because we're not really editing today. We're just kind of just using our footage. So go to that third page, which is the edit page, and we're just going to bring, you can just drag select both clips and drag them into the timeline. And you can play in the timeline now, and they'll play one after another. And you know, you'll be able to see what you shot. All right. So I'm not going to cover at all editing or cutting clips at all. You guys will cover that this semester, it sounds like. Um, what we are here to talk about today is the color, the color management, and like log, et cetera. So I'm going to click on my screen and look at my screen on the TVs the gear in the bottom right of DaVinci. And this is your project settings. We're going to skip over these. You guys all shot 16 by 9. Even if you shot 4K, it's going to be downscaled, but it doesn't matter. That, so what we're going to do is I'm going to click on color management. And you guys should be watching my screen. You see this color management top up here, tab up here? We can see up here, these are the default color management settings. And we see a familiar term. We see Rec. 709. Rec. 709, all right? So the two things we have here is timeline color space and output color space. Earlier, during the fundamental part, I was discussing how... Oh, no, sorry, we're going to yes. stop for a second. There's some people playing Tickle Snake. Are we there, Brady? Yeah. All right, you guys, please, look at the screens above you or turn and face Colin. Whatever you got to do, here we go. Colin, take it away. All right, so yeah, do not follow... You can have this menu open, but don't click buttons that I'm clicking for right now. We'll, we'll be clicking buttons soon enough. So we see timeline color space is set to Rec. 709. Output color space is set to Rec. 709. Earlier in this presentation, we discussed how, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to that slideshow, we discussed how color spaces are used across different things. So that first one is monitors. So a monitor is going to display in a certain color space. That's going to be our output color space because we're outputting to our screen. We want to be viewing as Rec. 709. Sometimes I work with sRGB, but because we're in film and how I mentioned, you know, television and the dark surround, we're going to be using Rec. 709. So then what is the timeline color space? Now let's go back to that presentation. That's that middle section, how software has different working color spaces. And that is what all the math or, you know, just whatever operations you're doing on are being run in that color space. So right now, that is also Rec. 709. I'm going to close this, and you keep hands off computers still. Let's see what our clips look like, and let's understand why they look that way. So log is washed out. But, I mean, it looks washed out as we expect because we're viewing it as Rec. 709 on our monitor. So even though that log footage has not been converted to video yet, it at least looks where we expect it to look. We, look at, we expect it to look washed out, and it does, so we're good. Because, I mean, sometimes you can mess some, some, something up, and it would just look completely wrong. Let's go to our other clip. It looks like video. So this we shot with camera Rec. 709, which is not identical to the Rec. 709 in our timeline, but I'm gonna, that's why we had to import that file, which that was all that annoying stuff. But it is similar enough to where this footage it was already in Rec. 709, so when we're viewing it as Rec. 709, it looks, it looks regular, it looks perfect. 
I'm going to do something that I do not want you guys to do. I'm going to click on my clip and I'm going to go to the color page. What I do want you guys to do real quick is I'm going to give you a brief overview of the color page. There's all these buttons at the top that are going to open panels and then close panels. The one that I want to have open right now is nodes. So who has heard of nodes before or like, oh, nodes. There's kind of like a, oh, nodes are scary type thing, but honestly, they're, it's extremely simple. You see this left dot? That is our footage input. And this right dot is basically, okay, that's what we're seeing. So anything that goes between means that we're just applying it to our footage and we'll see it. So if I have this node selected, I can go down to my first set of color tools and I'm just gonna make everything kind of blue. You see this node now has an effect on it. And because our footage, it's coming in, the effect's being applied and then it's going out. That's as simple as it is. So that's on one node. If I press Option S, or I can right click and ha hit Add Node Corrector, I can make another one. Still, not like, once again, that's not scary. So our first one, we made it blue. Second one's not doing anything right now. Let's second one. I'm just going to slide this wheel to make it brighter. So now our first one made it blue. Our second one made it brighter. And it's really, like I said, it's pretty straightforward. So input. Then we made it blue. Then we made it brighter. And then we just this is just what we're seeing, you know. We could have made it brighter, so I'm going to click on this node, and I can hit Command-D to disable it. So its effect is not going to happen, but I can bring it back on by pressing that same thing. I could have also made it brighter on the same one. So now it could, it's brighter and blue all in one node, and that's fine. You can kind of just decide how you prefer to work, but sometimes you might have your blue, and you're like, oh, I love what this blue looks like. And now you're like, okay, I want to make it brighter, but you want to see what it looks like before and after. I can still see that as blue. But if I'm deciding how bright I want it to be, okay, oh, I want it this bright. And I'm like, okay, I want to see what it looks like before and after. It's not blue anymore because it's in the same node, so it's disabling both effects. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to delete the second node that I made. So you guys don't have that node because you've just been watching. And then just to make it look like yours, I'm going to right click this node. I'm going to hit reset node grade so this node is doing nothing again. Okay. So this is the part that I don't want you guys to do. We're going to look at our log footage, and we're going to see that it's washed out, which means our black point is kind of gray. It's not black. And we see it's desaturated, so there's not enough saturation. So what I might think to do is, oh, let me color correct it. So once again, this bottom left uh, is our first set of color tools, and these are used quite often. I'm a big fan of them. They're called Lift, Gamma, and Gain. And then we have one called Offset. So you guys have used Lumetric Color. So you guys know how there's shadows, midtones, highlights, and an exposure control. These are similar. They don't behave exactly the same. But Lift mostly affects the shadow regions. Gamma mostly affects the midtones. Gain mostly affects the highlights. And Offset affects everything, which is like exposure. So the one difference between the two is that Premiere will have more of a, you know, a crunched up version of what highlights mean. So maybe in Premiere, if we change the highlights, it might only affect like the brightest spot. But in Resolve, it will actually gain, will affect everything except for black, but as in a gradation. So it will affect white the most, and it will affect less and less and less and less and less until black is not affected at all. What that means though, is that the things near black are still affected a little bit which might be confusing or like not familiar to you guys. A tool that might be more familiar that I'm not going to go into, but you can do further research on, is the HDR wheels. And this will behave more like Premiere, where you can have a more specific, like if I go here, this, if I change this light control, it is only those light parts. Does that make sense? But for now, I'm going to go back to here, and I want to make this footage less washed out and more saturated. So the shadows are too bright. And like I said, lift mostly affects shadows. A way you can remember that, at least for me, is like shadows are dark, so you would want to lift them up. So lift is affecting shadows. And then from there, it's just gamma is midtone, and then gain is highlight, just it goes in order. So what I'm going to do is this wheel right here. Uh, OK, so first of all, you see these color wheels. You've probably seen these in Lumetri Color as well. If I, I can use these to tint. So if I tint on lift, 
It will mostly affect the shadows, but you can see, like I said, it kind of does affect everything. It's also kind of weird because most of our footage is, if we look at, do you guys, are you guys familiar with the histogram or the scopes on this bottom right? Not really. If you want to do a quick, like, what those scopes are telling us. Okay, so this is telling us, um, as it goes from left to right. So on the left side of the scope is the left side of our image and the right side of a scope is our right side of the image. And it kind of shows us from, you know, zero to the brightest value where all of our pixels are being occupied. And you can see we have all this range, which should remind you of dynamic range. But right now, this log, it's really crunched up in the middle. So if I lift gamma gain, whatever, everything is so similar that there's not necessarily even highlights, shadows, or midtones. One thing that should show you about the left to right thing is you see this um, on the right side, this long line that's higher up than everything. Quiz them to find out what that is. Yeah, what do you think that is on the screen? It's the, it's the bulb lamp on the right end of the screen. Exactly, it's exactly. It's showing it vertically as well. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so what we can do is while I'm making these adjustments, I'm going to be pulling all of the data to a more, you know, more, we're going to pull from that log flattened, washed out view to a more contrasty video look. But once again, this is a demonstration of what not to do, and you'll see why, because there is a much better way of doing this. But this is the way that I originally learned, and lots of people did for quite a while. So those darks were too washed out and too gray, so I'm bringing them down. So like I said, you can, with these color wheels, you can make the, you can tint the color, but if you see this black radial dial, that will just affect like the brightness. So I brought the brightness of the darks down. Now uh, the midtones are too dark. So I'm gonna gamma up. Uh, actually, okay, I'm gonna, so if I made a mistake, I have a reset button right here. Actually, I'm going to gain up. I wanna bring only the highlights up. Okay. So there's a little bit of contrast. It looks decent. Yeah, it looks, looks pretty decent. Still, it's too desaturated. So at the bottom, these are our main tools. So most of your main tools are going to be in here. We have color temp, tint. Saturation, though. So we said log is desaturated. So let's add some saturation. And boom. We've gone from, so remember, I can Command D, disable my node, log, to a kind of video looking look, right? Why would we not want to do this, though? There's a much easier way, actually. So I'm going to go back to the slideshow, and I'm going to go to this section about log. So you don't necessarily, I'll, I'll just, so this red line, remember, this is a, an example of a log gamma, a log transfer function, how I mentioned how it kind of goes out of the bounds and has more dynamic range. You might notice, do you guys recognize what this screenshot is from? Desmos, have you guys used that in a math class before? So what that should tell you is that I was able to plot an exact mathematical equation for that log transfer function. So without overcomplicating, what that means is because if that log gamma can be mathematically defined, we can do the opposite. Doing the opposite will bring it to this blue line, and then from there, we can go from the blue line to the purple line of Rec. 709, and that can be done automatically because the math is just defined and built into DaVinci Resolve. So that will actually do what I just did better and faster and more accurately. So um, I'm going to show you a way to do that, but it is not going to be, once again, it's not going to be the way that we are going to do it and I will explain why, but sorry to do that to you. So I'm gonna add a new node. So when on our nodes, we can apply like these color tools. So far, we've only used this bottom left one, but there's also other ones like curves. If you guys have used Photoshop, you've probably seen curves. And there's some other tools we can use, like this one is just blurring and sharpening. Another, some more tools are accessible if we click on this top one and we open the effects panel. And then there's a lot of effects. So I'm gonna search for the one that I want. And once again, um, the point of this is to show what I mean of that automatic transformation, but do not pay attention to the buttons I'm pressing and I'm not even going to explain them necessarily. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it exactly what it was shot with and I will get into more detail with that once we go on to ACES. 
Um, and then once I tell it exactly what it was shot with, we are going to be able to just do that automatic transformation. All right, boom. So you might see it's a little bit darker than we might expect. And that's actually because I shot this shot underexposed. So this is actually accurate. Um, and you, you'll notice how that was just a node called the color space transform. Because if we go back to this graph, Rec 709 is a color space. And this log color space is a color space. And what we're doing is we're transforming, which is to say going between. We're going from one to another. And the math is already built into Resolve to do that automatically to give us an image closer to what we saw in the camera. But you guys might say, look, this node, that was a lot of settings and annoying. And I would agree. So we're going to go to the slideshow again. And then we're about to have you guys do this yourself, so don't worry. But really quickly, I'm going to talk about ACES. So raise your hand if you guys have heard about ACES. This in here. So do you guys see how, let me see if I can zoom in on a Mac. I don't use a Mac. Uh, OK. Whoa, that is your shoulder. All right. All right, yeah, I, I do not use a Mac, so let's see. OK, well, you guys can pretty much see. Do you see how this is white, just pure white clipped? Yeah. Meanwhile, if I turn this off, in log, we have detail. Yeah. That should remind you exactly of what's happening here. Detail, and then it gets clipped. Luckily, we haven't saved this image out to where that's permanent damage that's been done. Because if I make a new node after this and reduce the gain, so remember, gain is mostly highlights. I bring gain down. That detail is still there, but it's in the graph. Yes. So look at that histogram. I'm going to disable this node. Do you guys see how that, that there's no longer that peak of where that thing is? If I turn this node back on, look to where that node, sh that little spot should be as I bring it down. Do you see how it just zoomed down there? Since it's above that maximum point, 10, 1023, and if you th we're thinking about bit depth again, Resolve is working in 10-bit right now because 8-bit is 256, 10-bit 10 is 1024. So because it is above 1023, it's clipping at pure white. Okay. If I bring it down, we can recover that detail. But if I save the image right now, that's pure white, and we have no, there's no more data. It's all just pure white. So let's think. What we could do is, OK, let me, let me bring down the highlights a lot. But in order to bring the, hi the highlights down enough to see everything, we're going to have to lift everything back up. It's going to be hard. It's going to be annoying. Just like how we had to manually go from log to video the first time, we're going to have an easier solution. And that's called tone mapping. So what that does is it goes from this HDR, high dynamic range. It's able to take our dynamic range. And it's able to squeeze and compress everything closer to that standard dynamic range. And what that's going to do is it's going to follow, um, you guys are familiar with film. There's something called a characteristic filmic S-curve. And a lot of people are in love with the look of film. Like there's digital and there's film. And some people are like, oh, film is so much better. It's because of the way that film reacts to, to light. What it does is as light gets brighter and brighter, instead of shooting out to oblivion like this was doing, it has something called a shoulder. So if you see the shape of my shoulder, it kind of curves up like that. As it gets brighter and brighter, it tapers off like a shoulder like that. And we can see this here. As it gets brighter and brighter, it has a beautiful highlight roll off. So that's a term when you have this shoulder that's taking these strong highlights and rolling them off into a standard dynamic range where it doesn't clip and it shows all of our detail. Another advantage of tone mapping is do you guys see um, the blue here? This is another reason why people are like, oh, film over digital. Do you see how, how kind of nasty and crunchy that cyan is? Yeah. That's another characteristic of a direct conversion from that wide gamut and log color space to Rec. 709 video. OK. Um, look at what that tone mapping did. That digital nastiness is gone. So I have another slide to show tone mapping. So if we look here. As these colors get brighter and brighter and brighter, do you see? You guys recognize this cyan? It's that disgusting digital cyan right there. 
On our left side also, you guys know lightsabers. So if we have something red and it gets really, really bright, it's actually gonna look white. And then as that fades off with that glow, then we can actually tell that it's red with that glow. If we don't have any tone mapping that's going to allow us to have that like natural response, then it's gonna look like this. And as we get brighter and oops, as we get brighter and brighter, it's just gonna get clipped off at these nasty digital colors. With tone mapping, we can have this, and it's called a path to white because as it gets brighter, it desaturates in a natural way that's similar to the way that we see things. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna delete this and delete this. And this is, you guys are about to follow along, so get ready. So I'm going, so one part of ACES is the tone mapping that I've talked about. Another part of ACES is just it has its color spaces. There's Ace's color spaces. This giant one, you can see it covers every like possible color humans can see by going outside of the bounds. Um, that one is mostly used for archival. So when, um, when a film is finished filming and they deliver to the theaters, they have their final, you know, their final Rec 709 or whatever they're displaying to, their, their video file. But like I said, if we delivered this final image right here, we have no data in this white. So what they do is in addition, they save a backup archive that has all of the high dynamic range and it's converted to this bigger color space. This color space is actually too big for working and because there's so many weird imaginary colors, it messes stuff up if you're trying to use that while doing, like if your working space was set to that one and you're trying to color grade, weird stuff would happen, which is why they made a smaller one. Uh, so this is a smaller gamut and there's different, like I said, just like Rec. 709 and sRGB, they have the same triangle, the same gamut, but they have different gammas, so they're different color spaces. There's multiple color spaces that use this same triangle. Um, but the ones that we care about, uh, well, the one that I care about as a visual effects artist is mostly ACES CG, and the CG is for computer graphics. But we are not doing computer graphics, so we are gonna be focusing on CC or CCT. These are gonna be log color spaces. So why would that be good? We're gonna be working in a wider gamut. So right now, if I go to my gear, all of our calculations are done in Rec. 709. And remember, Rec. 709 is a smaller gamut and it has a gamma for our display. If we work in a log color space like that ACES CCT, what that's going to allow us to do is first of all, that, that tone mapping that I talked about that will make everything look good, that automatically goes from ACES CCT to Rec. 709. And also some operations will behave better in, um, in that log color space. So just for an example, I'm gonna boost saturation on Mr. White. And you can see how his skin gets really nasty orange. That will, stuff like saturation and other operations behave much nicer in a log color space, but while you're color grading. But once again, you need to be viewing it with a video color space so everything makes sense. So that was a lot of words. So now we're gonna actually implement that so that it makes sense. So what we have right now is we have our timeline with our two clips, all right, boom, boom. And I deleted my node, so I'm just gonna add it. Oh, it added it back for me, good. Oh, no, it didn't. So real quick, I can click on this timeline button. So while I'm in the color page, I can go between clips. I'm just gonna add my node back, but right now mine should be set up exactly like your guys's. Do you have a question? Yeah, I think we're gonna put it back at the project. I'm actually about to open that up again and you guys are gonna follow along. Okay. So color management. So we've discussed using ACEs. Right now, we're just working with the default settings and we're, view we're calculating stuff in Rec. 709 and we're looking at it in Rec. 709. Let's switch to ACES, so everybody follow along. That top button says DaVinci YRGB. Click on that, and then click on ACES CCT. All right, that second box is gonna say ACES version 1.3. Keep that where it is. Like I've mentioned, ACES is certainly not perfect, but they keep updating it, and that's just right now the most modern version. The third one is ACES Input Transform. 
keep that as it is. It should say no input transform. So, so far, all you've done is set it to ACES CCT and you've clicked nothing else. Next, there's a checkbox that says apply ACES reference gamut compress. Keep it on. The first thing we're going to change is ACES output transform. So remember, in the, old, in the default settings, the output was Rec. 709 because that's what we're outputting to our monitor. And once again, we want to view it as Rec. 709. So open that up and then click on Rec. 709, just the regular one. OK. Next one says process node LUTs in. Keep that as it is. Right below that, there's a checkbox that says use color space aware grading tools. Check that checkbox. It's off by default. And now that is all the settings we're changing. Look at a monitor. What is it? Yeah. Look at a monitor and make sure your settings match it exactly. All right. Now we're going to hit save. And we're going to, ex we might expect, OK, whoa, I just talked about magic of aces in that view transform. Is it, is it going to look beautiful? Hit save and it's going to look, no, it should just look wrong and terrible. OK. So you guys don't have to, so hands off again and just watch for a second. You guys will be coming back to do stuff. I'm going to click my gear just to explain something. Now we see this. Um, we have our color science. It's set to ACES CCT. Before, our working space where all the calculations were done in was Rec. 709, and we were viewing it as Rec. 709. Now, we're still viewing it as Rec. 709 because of this ACES output transform, but the calculations are being done in ACES CCT. So what does that mean? Remember how our video clip looked pretty good because it was already in Rec. 709 and our working space was Rec. 709? What that should make us think is that if our footage was already in ACES CCT, it would look normal. But right now we have something in the Blackmagic log and we have something in Rec. 709 and that is different than ACES CCT. So just like we did a color space conversion from the log to the video, what we're going to do now is we're going to convert both the log and the video to ACES. Does that make sense to everybody? Even if it doesn't make sense, all you have to do is just trust, I guess. So it's all good. So in the color page, follow along now. Click on the Clips button in the top left, and you should be able to see both of your pieces of footage, and you can click on them. Click on the one that is Log. And then right click it, and there's a big menu. Find the one that says ACES Input Transform and hover open it so that it opens. Does everyone see that? You should see a bunch of different types of cameras. And remember, just as we talked about earlier, different cameras have different color spaces. So what this is doing is it's giving us a menu of color spaces that our footage might be in, because we need to tell it what color space we are in so that it can convert it to ACES so that we can view it properly. So we shot with a black magic design camera. So hover over that tab, and we shot our log footage in film. So the first one you'll see is Black Magic Design Film. That's not actually correct. This menu is a little bit confusing because they have a lot of different versions of this film. The most recent version, which is the version that we shot on our cameras here, is Gen 5. So click on Gen 5. And it should look good. Good stuff. OK? Now, go to your second shot. So on that clips menu, click on that one. So look at your video clip. Same thing. We're going to right click. ACES input transform. So we shot it as black magic design, but we didn't use, a, we didn't use black magic design's film LUT. We, they used the Rec. 709 camera standard. So if you might be looking through these menus at home, if you did this without that file I gave you, and there is one called Rec. 709, that is not the correct one. For a simple explanation, Rec. 709 is a display standard, and there's also another version for camera color space, which uses the same triangle, but a different gamma. And that's why we need that special file that we put into that folder that will give us the correct color space for Rec. 709 camera. 
So we put that file in there so that in this drop down menu, hover over ACES transform DCTL. And does everybody see the IDT dash rec 709 camera, rec 709 LIN ACES AP0? I will talk more about this at the end, but I'm making right now a, vid a, a really long, I've been researching all this stuff for like the last like 10 months and I'm working on, it's mostly applied for VFX and CG artists, but I'm working on like a, it's gonna be like a four hour long YouTube masterclass and I'll talk, you have to do coding and stuff, but I can, ch I'll, I'll be talking about it in there. But you have to basically code this so it works properly. All right, um, for the people who, they had to create the folder manually, did it pop up? Okay, cool. And someone else created the manually. Did yours pop up? The, on that custom menu? Okay, good stuff. I was just asking since you had to manually make the folder, but it looked like it worked. Okay, cool. All right. So now what happened is everything is in the ACES color space and we're viewing it as Rec. 709 with the tone mapping that we talked about. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation, so look up for a second. So one advantage of ACES we've talked about is the tone mapping. The other advantage is gonna go ahead and be this, this gamut and this color space that's gonna be better for working and color grading. The third advantage is what we just did. It has a built-in library of transforms so that you can easily convert from your camera to ACES, which is gonna let you just make everything conform and look proper before you start working. All right, so now everyone has their clips open, and if we go between the two, they should look pretty good. They should look very close because we shot them together and we just converted both of them into ACES. There is, however, a difference. So that main difference, scroll between the two and see if you notice anything on the histogram, that waveform scope in the bottom right. Oh yeah, so in that bottom right, make sure you guys see these three icons. There's a diamonds, there's a wavy thing, and there's an eye. Click on the wavy thing, and then there's a drop box. It might say something else. Click on waveform. And there's a chance some of your footage doesn't actually demonstrate what I'm going to show. So really quickly, look up at my screen, and then look at my histogram. Do you guys notice something? All right, so really quickly, look at my screen. And so I'm hovering over the log one. Remember what happened before when we went directly, when I did that manual thing where I went from, from the log to the video without the tone mapping? And then my highlight from my, my, uh, this bulbous sphere light thing, it was way up and out. We can actually see on the waveform the tone mapping in action. Even though it looks, I mean, pretty white, it's actually all within our range, and you can see it's not a straight line. It actually still has some data in there, and if we wanted to push it, we could pull it down more by gaining it down, so we can see the detail in it still much easier than we could before. So what I wanted you guys to notice is if you look at my screen, if I go between the two, you can see that that peak highlight of that bulbous sphere light is much lower, and it's also much flatter. So what I'm going to do is in this node thing, these are applying, you see at the top it says clip. These two things on my timeline are clips. And if I go to my edit tab, like this is just what a clip is, it's just these individual things. If I go to the color page again, these nodes are affecting per clip. So they're unique to each clip. If I click on that word and go to timeline, I can create a node that will affect everything in this timeline. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, on that node, gain down the highlights. So I'm gonna make the highlights darker, which will make everything darker. And now we're gonna go between the log and the Rec. 709. So I spent so much time telling you guys, like guys, log is a higher dynamic range. Now we can actually see it in action. Do you guys see that? And look at that vector scope as well. Or it's not the vector scope, look at the waveform. This is just a constant color. It's just completely flat. There's no information on the video. It's just white blown out shit. Yep, yep. <laughs> but look at this beautiful, it has so much data on this and it's being perfectly tone mapped beautifully. Look at that. So I'm gonna delete my timeline level node. I'm gonna go back to my clip. 
Now I'm going to do, um, I'm going to mess with my saturation a bit. I'm going to increase that. And you guys notice how I'm going to push it quite high. But I, I didn't, I should have done a back to back comparison because you can grab stills and resolve. But the skin tone, when you increase in like the aces, wider gam gamut and log space, operations such as uh, saturation and just in general, they all behave differently. So if you're used to how Lumetri uh, works, that is working in a Rec. 709 space, or even if you've used Resolve before and you use the default settings, it might get a little bit, it might take a little bit to get used to how exactly everything's behaving because it behaves differently for sure. But often it's going to be behaving more naturally and in a, in a way that's going to be easier to you know, manipulate and get towards your creative vision. So it is 314. Let's do five minutes. I want you guys to grade your shots. So really quick before we do that. So it's my fault, my fault. No, no, we got this. So we have this high dynamic range. It's probably going to be pretty contrasty. So we have a lot of shadows and a lot of darks. The first thing I want you guys to do is do some just exposure and contrast correction. You can make it look however you want, but change the exposure overall and and like per shadow, like lift gamma gain, and also change the saturation. And then you can mess with some of these other tools. So we have curves in here, the HDR wheels I talked about, and then we have all these effects up here. I want you guys to just mess with the, the luminance and then mess with the colors too. So I'm gonna show you really quick one tool we can use on this curves. Do you guys see all these little buttons down here? These are different versions of the curves. If we have, and it'll say hue versus sat, what this does is we can change um, we can change things based on the current hue. So if I click this red dot down here, this will give me a dot where red is. And then if I bring it up, it will rotate everything that's red away from, it's hard to see and it also does it kind of subtly. I can't zoom in. Let me do not red because there's not very obvious red in here. Let me do, he's a kind of a bluish shirt. So what this will do is I can rotate the hue so I can make his shirt more red or more green. Do you guys see that? And then there's some other ones in here too. So if I do hue versus sat, I could make the blues more saturated, which it is a bit subtle, but we can bring that up or we can desaturate it. So I just guys, for like five minutes until 320, I just want you guys to do some nice color correction and color grading. And just see how everything's feeling in ACES. And Colin's gonna come around. I'll be around too. Pretend you're in a video class and you are now ready to color correct. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. the last 10 minutes, I'm going to go over another thing. Yeah, we got 28 minutes and we probably... Oh, it's 45. Yeah, but we don't want to go right to 45. Let's let them color correct. Yeah, give them 10 minutes then. I thought it was over at 3.30, so, ten, so until 25, color correct. All right. You guys got 10 minutes to play with it. And also, this is meant as an introduction to make sure all your tools are working right before color correction. I'm sure Ethan Lean, if, he, if he's come in yet, he'll probably come in and give you guys like an actual master class on how to actually creatively color correct. Right now, I'm just trying to make all of your tools work properly. Nice. Remember earlier, I asked you guys to shoot in ProRes 422. There was a reason for that. So I'm gonna switch back to the laptop. I don't have time to go in depth on this, unfortunately, but, um, what we're going to talk about really quickly is the difference between ProRes and its different options, and then Blackmagic RAW, B-RAW, and its different options as a very brief overview, and you guys are going to want to get more into this in the future. So earlier I was talking about um, how we have the sensor with these filters, and it goes from these individual red, green, blue, and it combines them all to one RGB pixel. That happens in the camera if you're shooting a pre-encoded format, which ProRes is. A RAW, by definition, format, saves just the sensor data. So it just saves this without that interpolation. And what that means is when we bring it into Resolve, I have, I shot some RAW earlier, so I'm gonna pull that open. Um, we have access to some more controls from the sensor. And so we have that B RAW. I'm gonna bring that open here. And then I'm gonna drag that into my timeline. So one thing you might notice, I'm gonna go here. It's gonna take a second because it is, there we go. Yeah, 
Like, so that's one reason. Raw it has to do all that calculation that I talked about. Meanwhile, ProRes, it already did it. So let me even see, is it working? It might not be showing us the result. Well, anyways, so, okay, our, our other stuff, we wanted to right-click it and set the ACES input. Oop, what did I just do? Okay. We wanted to set the ACES input transform. We click on a raw piece of footage, and it is gone. That's confusing. What do we do? The reason for this is because ProRes was pre-encoded in a color space. But raw is raw sensor data, so what that means is that DaVinci Resolve can just automatically, when it creates it into actual footage, it can just automatically put it into the correct color space. So if we bring in a raw piece of footage into our color tab and we click to the left of the primary wheels, this camera raw option, we can see what's happening. We can see that it's, it's using automatic settings from the project, but if we want to customize it, we can click on clip. What it's doing is it's automatically detecting what it was shot in as raw and it's automatically bringing it into ACES. That means we don't have to set the ACES input transform because it's raw. What it does do is, like I said, we get more control because we have sensor data from the footage. So we, have an, we straight up have an ISO button. We can change the ISO in post. So boom. Also color temp. So we can change the color temperature of footage um, just with a color grade. You know, in this color tab, there's a temp here. That can work fine, but when we do it this way, it's working on the sensor data, so it's technically more photo, photographic. That doesn't necessarily mean better or worse, but take that for what it, what it means and for what it's worth. So we have exposure. So, okay, that's cool. We have some extra controls, but it's not necessarily, that part doesn't seem that crazy. The main advantage of RAW is also its disadvantage, which is that it has very little compression. So what is compression? So we've talked about file sizes and the importance of you know, these small file sizes, or at least making sure that we're optimizing and deciding that we have enough storage space. So remember ProRes 422. Do you see this graph, 444? This should look familiar, 422. What this is on the right is a type of compression called chroma subsampling that happens to ProRes. So what it does is it keeps all of the, all of the different brightness data but for every batch of four pixels, it actually only saves two of the color data, which is a type of compression so that it doesn't have to save as much data. That also means it has, it's lossy. So the raw footage, which doesn't have this subsampling, this chroma subsampling, is going to be, it's going to be more representative of our actual pixels that we recorded, but at the cost of being a larger file size, and it's going to be pretty slow, as we saw, to load as we're playing it. Um, the different types of ProRes and RAW, if we go back to the camera here, we can see we have ProRes 422, HQ and LT and Proxy. Um, these are actually all 422. This is actually short for 422 HQ, 422 LT, 422 Proxy. In the slideshow, I have this. Essentially, they just have different data rates. So HQ is going to be a less compression than regular 422. And then as we go down, it's going to be more and more compressed, which means it's going to be a lower file size, but a lower image quality. It depends on what you're shooting if that image quality hit actually is going to be an issue for what you're shooting. Sometimes that lower file size is worth it. Oops. If we go to Blackmagic RAW, it's not completely uncompressed. So Blackmagic RAW doesn't have this chroma subsampling, but it does have a different type of compression, which ProRes has both. Blackmagic just has this. Um, the compression is called the discrete cosine transform. All that means is that it can get rid of high frequency data. High frequency is if we look at this top left, that's just a one color. That's a blank square. And these top parts, they're like bigger shapes. Um, yes, thank you. All right, this top left, these are bigger shapes. You know, That's a low frequency shape. When something is high frequency, it means there's a lot of granular detail. So this bottom right, you see it's like a checkerboard. That's more granular textural detail than the top left. One yep. So when we have more compression with this discrete cosine transform, it discards granular detail, which means when we have a more compressed file, which means we have a lower file size, we lose some detail. So if you ever see like snow or rain or the yeah, glitter, if you have a more compressed video, that's going to look worse. But if you don't have high frequency detail, you can get away with more compression. And what that's going to do is that's going to let you have um, 
smaller file sizes. So as we increase in Blackmagic RAW, increase in here, more compression, and there's two different types of compression that you can read about online because I don't have time to cover. Um, and final thing is just the, the differences. B-RAW has less compression because there's no chroma subsampling. Another difference between the two is you can see here, some of these are grayed out. Some of them can only shoot certain formats. So if you need a certain resolution, you might need to use one or the other. Um, and there's just different compression. RAW is slower to load because it has to do that calculation and interpolation, but it's going to have more of that um, sensor data. Um, and then ProRes is going to be more used everywhere else. You don't have to decode the RAW. And yeah, but file size difference depends on your shot. Just do tests. Thank you, Codlin. Yes. What a day. You guys go home. Tell your parents everything you, you got from today. And your dad's like, hey, you want more spaghetti? You could just be like, I need you to subsample your phone and then maybe color space your B-Raw. All right. Thank you, Conlon. Yep. All right. I'm going to kill this.